We've looked at remakes and sequels, so we might as well keep it going with adaptations, Hollywood's other favorite money tree. But the good ones, the interesting ones, the ones that gain a little something when they make it to the screen. These are our picks for the five best adaptations of all time. Right out of the gate, elephant in the room, the biggest, broadest, most common source of adaptations is fiction. Novels and novellas and short stories, Hollywood is optioning another one every time you turn around. As for our favorites, God, where do we begin? From the faithful likes of No Country for Old Men and To Kill a Mockingbird and The Lord of the Rings and Fight Club and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and Stand By Me, to the wild-born creations of The Shining, Rashomon, Dr. Strangelove, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, The Conformist, The Trial, Forrest Gump, and Blade Runner and on and on and on. Don't say 2001 because that novel was written with the screenplay, and because for our first adaptation pick, we don't think it gets much better than John Milius and Francis Ford Coppola turning Conrad's Heart of Darkness into Apocalypse Now. Are you an assassin? I'm a soldier. You're neither. You're an errand boy. Sent by grocery clerks to collect a bill. While this adaptation trades the Congo for Vietnam, late 19th century British imperialism for 1960s American Cold War containment, and an ivory trader for a colonel, the basic scaffolding of the story is the same. A company man travels up a river on orders to find and kill a man who has allegedly gone mad with power that now threatens his superiors. And along the way, he risks falling victim to that self-same madness in a series of increasingly psychotic episodes, culminating in the final decision, which is really the illness, the madness or the sanity. More than the plot, Coppola grabs onto the suffocating prose and transmutes it into haunting, overwhelming imagery. There is transformation of it from one kind of beauty into another, but also originality of the best kind, as if Conrad's book was just a map of the soul that Coppola used to go find his own. Of course, there's no adaptation giveaway like the ubiquitous based on a true story title card. Nonfiction books have given us thusly labeled movies like Goodfellas, The Social Network, and All the President's Men, while articles have turned into Dog Day Afternoon, In Cold Blood, and On the Waterfront. And then of course, there's the biopic that essentially adapts a life as in The Elephant Man, Raging Bull, Lawrence of Arabia, Malcolm X, and Andre Rublev. Tina Fey turned a book about how to handle bullying as a parent into Mean Girls, and Oliver Stone turned a couple different accounts of an assassination into the insanity that is JFK, but nobody, nobody has done an adaptation bolder and more originally than Charlie Kaufman turning Susan Orlin's The Orchid Thief into, well, adaptation. Maybe I can help. It's about flowers. Okay. Um... But it's not only about flowers, right? I mean, you have the crazy plant nut guy, right? He's funny, right? There's not nearly enough of him to fill a book. So Orlean digresses in long passages, blah, blah, blah. No narrative really unites these passages. New York Times book review. I can't structure this. It's that sp sprawling New Yorker shit. Oh, man. The, the, the book has no story. There's no story. All right. Make one up. The Orchid Thief is a slightly meandering true story about orchids and those obsessed with them. And if you think nonfiction book about collecting plants sounds like an awful basis for a Hollywood film, so does Charlie Kaufman, the author of its adaptation, and so does Charlie Kaufman, the lead character of that adaptation, who is struggling to adapt that book into the story about his adapting it into the exact adaptation we're watching called Adaptation. And so does his twin brother Donald Kaufman, who was actually nominated for the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay despite not actually existing in real life. Seriously, unless you're Charlie Kaufman, you couldn't make this stuff up. But what emerges is a narrative about originality and uniqueness and obsession and the creative struggle that fluidly combines the source material with Kaufman's real struggle with the utterly invented in a beautiful car crash life imitating art imitating art imitating life meta narrative that stretches the very concept of adaptation to its utmost limits. And my god, we love it.
In the, well, no duh category of adaptations, we couldn't forget to look at plays, and they're often pretty ripe for the picking, with all the conflict and characters and staging and dialogue already there on the page. Although that doesn't mean some of them don't benefit from slight or significant reimagining for the new medium. So many adaptations are faithfully filmed chamber affairs, like 12 Angry Men, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Angels in America, A Streetcar Named Desire. Others have been blown up into strikingly cinematic bonanzas, Amadeus, Moonlight, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, Casablanca, and incendies. Of course, it'd be impossible to leave out the bar. You can find him everywhere from filmed in the round, the Bronx, the beach, the jungle, modern Rome, high school, and everywhere in between. But we most love finding him in feudal Japan, as King Lear in Ran, and our third pick, Macbeth in Throne of Blood. La verità è che la tua fortuna è più lenta di quella del capitano Bashizu, ma dura molto di più. Di più? Che vuoi dire con questo? Voglio dire che tu hai un figlio e che un giorno diventerà lui il signore del castello Kumonosu. The ubiquity of Shakespeare's text serves as an ongoing point of cinematic comparison, allowing us to mark the massive effect different productions can have on the same story. In this case, the Scottish play, one of murder and ambition and betrayal. And Kuwasawa's Throne of Blood moves quite far away in its writing while still landing with the same power. It is distinctly quiet and visual and cinematic where Macbeth was poetic and verbal. The witches become a spirit, the soldiers become samurai, the deaths happen on screen, and in the end, Washizu's comes from an unexpected source. The motivation are different, distinctly of another culture, power supplanting emasculation as a drive. But this long and varied cross-pollination of cultures, of a 17th century England take on 11th century Scotland, as interpreted by a 20th century post-World War II Japanese man looking at the 16th century samurai period through distinctly modern eyes, has the effect not of muddying the story, but of clarifying it of polishing that which is universal between the different places and eras until the work shines in those places with the most shared humanity. Now where plays get to draw from a built-in drama and dialogue, our next category gets built-in visuals. These are comics, mangas, graphic novels, and these two run the gamut from the plucked off the page onto the screen feel of Sin City to the, wait, that was based on a graphic novel of Road to Perdition. Somewhere in between you can find 300, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, Akira, Persepolis, A History of Violence, and Blue is the Warmest Color. And right there towards the wild end you also find our second to last pick, the Korean film based on a Japanese manga of the same name, Old Boy. Old Boy is a good manga, but Park Chan-wook looked at it and clearly saw potential. He saw a frame and a scenario and a situation about a man jailed mysteriously for years and then manipulated for the purpose of some kind of mysterious revenge and decided it was a vein of gold ore that he's going to mine. And mind it, he did. He pops the hood and completely rebuilds the engine, recalculating motivations, redrawing family ties, and completely recalibrating the tone. Now, I don't want to spoil the story for those of you who haven't seen it yet, but there's a ton more detail worth going into if you have. So, we did this week's What's the Difference about Old Boy for your full comparison fix. It's like Shark Week, but for Old Boy. And only just these two things. Just check it out, it'll be out soon. And finally, closing in at our last slot, we got a look at all the other weird and unexpected places Hollywood has conjured up adaptations from. That's right, the etc. category. A surefire way to make sure everybody's unhappy with your top pick, as if that's ever stopped us before. There's the Indian Runner and Alice's Restaurant and Convoy, all based on songs, not to mention the Fantasias. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that was a radio show before it was a book. Anomalisa, adapted from a radio play. And Tomb Raider and Resident Evil, both from video games. There's Pirates of the Caribbean, based based on a Disneyland ride. The Transformers series and the Lego movies from Toys and Mars Attacks comes from a trading card series. In researching this list, we were delighted to learn that there's an Australian film adapted from a critical review of Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief called Benjamin Sniddlegrass and The Cauldron of Penguins. Although we regret to admit we haven't seen it yet, but are definitely going to. And maybe you're like us and you think you hate that Hollywood has taken to adapting board games until you remember that it also brought us Clue. However, our pick is based on a poem, the rarely adapted medium that has given us Howl, the color of pomegranates. And for our last slot, based on Homer's Odyssey, no, not Troy, it's Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> Hey, any of you boys, 
Smithies. Or, if not Smithies per se, were you otherwise trained in the metallurgic arts before straightened circumstances forced you into life aimless wanderers? <laughs> O Brother, Where Art Thou is much the same as our first pick. It takes a journey from the annals of classic literature and recontextualizes it into some version of modern America. Here we find ourselves amidst the Depression era south on the lamb with three rascally escapees instead of tempest-tossed post-Trojan war with Odysseus and crew. But where Apocalypse Now holds onto the emotional core of its source material, hewing closely in tone, O Brother pivots hard towards comedy, cheek, and parody. The prophet becomes a railroad man, the sirens become singing maiden, the cyclops becomes Big Dan, a Sheep Disguise becomes a sheet one, Poseidon becomes a jail warden, and obviously both Ulysses and Odysseus become chart-topping bluegrass singers. The way the Coens reinterpret the Odyssey's details is all the more fun for the knowing of it. They took epic Greek poetry and rewrote it as an old-timey bluegrass ballad, which is a pitch we're buying every single time out of a hundred. And it's part of why we think it's one of the best adaptations of all time. So what do you think? Disagree with any of our picks? Did we leave out any of your favorite adaptations? I'm sure we did, it's nothing personal. Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix Movie Lists.